without further ado, I would like to introduce our renowned keynote speaker for Block One, titled Successes and Challenges in Translational Neuropsychiatry Research, Dr. Trevor Robbins. Uh, Dr. Robbins is a professor of cognitive neuroscience at the University of Cambridge, having been professor of experimental psychology and head of the Department of Psychology. He is a fellow of the British for, uh, Psychological and Pharmacological Societies and the Academy, um, the, the Academy of Med Medical Sciences and the Royal Society. His contributions have been widely recognized through numerous prestigious prizes, including sharing the Brain Prize of the Greta Lundbeck European Brain Research Foundation and receiving the Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award from the American Psychological Society. Please drop any questions you might have for Trevor in the question and a portion of the Whova platform, again, on the right side of the, the screen. Uh, or you can um, drop them in the Zoom chat and I'll try to monitor that as well. Um, so we'll have a brief time for audience questions after the presentation. So now I will let Dr. Trevor Robbins himself tell you about some of his um, high impact translational research and share his insights into major successes and challenges in the field of neuropsychiatry research. So Trevor, welcome. And please go ahead and um, share your slides. I'll stop sharing mine. Oh, you're muted uh, still, Trevor. Muted. Yes. Good. Hello from Cambridge. It's great to be here to contribute to this exciting matrix in translational initiative. Um, do you want me to share my screen? I think we should do that. Yeah, that would be great. That's great. Uh, now, can you see this slide? Yes. I'm just going to um, put a pointer on as well, actually. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Yeah, I like to put a pointer on, there we go. Okay, so successes and challenges in translational neuropsychiatry research. Um, let me just minimize this little piece here. Yep, okay, that's gone. Good. Fine. Okay. Hey, my slides aren't advancing. Here we go. So there's a whole range of cognitive and behavioral syndromes which are in desperate need of treatment ranging from neurodegenerative disorders like the dementias all the way through to neuropsychiatric conditions including of course uh, substance use disorders they all have behavioral and, and cognitive characteristics which are desperately in need of treatment and i've just asterisked some of the ones i'm going to deal with briefly here alzheimer's disease parkinson's disease schizophrenia depression, ADHD, and substance use disorders, all in 20 minutes. <laughs> now, before we get any further, let me just say that we've made some absolutely fantastic advances in neuroscience in relation to mental health. Um, you know, so the examples I'm giving here um, really focus on the dopamine system. And just to remind everyone that, you know, We've learned so much about the distribution of these systems in the brain, how they work from these brilliant Scandinavian, originally neurobiologists, um, very basic science characterizing these systems. And of course, led ultimately by Colson, who saw the implications for Parkinson's disease and its treatment with L-DOPA. And then other scientists thinking about ADHD, for example, and schizophrenia and substance use disorders, all related to dopamine. And just to remind you about this seminal study, so Snyder and Ian Kreese in the 70s, showing, you know, a molecular relationship between binding to the D2 receptor and the efficacy of antipsychotic drugs. I mean, these are major advances. The problem's been that we haven't made enormous advances since then, although despite this incredible input of basic neuroscience. And when we start looking at the problems in translation, um, I've just tried to summarize a few of them here. I mean, we're dealing with very complex 
and largely unmapped pathophysiology and etiology of these psychiatric disorders. We don't really know what causes them. We don't really know in detail what aspects of the synaptic circuitries are deranged in these conditions in the brain. So therefore it's gonna be hard to treat them. Parkinson's disease in a sense um, is, is, is you know, somewhat misleading compared to the whole range of these other disorders. Multiple genes are involved, often of small effect, which makes the analysis very difficult from a genetic standpoint. We have a lack of biomarkers and endophenotypes which predict uh, either effects of treatment or indeed uh, whether the people are at risk for these disorders. Um, that's an ongoing area of research. We have these very complex phenotypes, um, sometimes contradicting themselves in terms of the precise package of symptoms involved. And we have comorbidities. So we may be dealing with more than one disorder at once. And then on top of this, um, in terms of translation, animal models traditionally have always been very useful as in the past with the dopamine systems. But I have to say um, there's been a bit of poverty and more especially naivety in the use of animal models. A lot of anthropomorphism, a lot of um, really quick and dirty tests rather than carefully thought out theoretical tests. And matching that, there's been a, a lack of back translational feedback, reverse translation, what I call bi-directional translation from the clinic, because we need that urgently to make the animal models more viable. Um, in, in addition, when one does have a drug, we go to phase three trials, and of course, then we're dealing with huge numbers of patients, very heterogeneous, very often, using often outmoded means of evaluating their, their symptoms. You know, questionnaires, clinical questionnaires, which are very useful, but may lack sensitivity. And of course, the agents themselves may have imperfections. They may not reach the brain properly. Uh, they may have toxic adverse effects and so on and so forth. And very often the poor old animal model has been blamed for a failure when in fact it's the drug that's actually uh, the culprit. So, and on top of that, I think I have to level a charge at Big Pharma in terms of business models and, and also at the regulatory authorities in terms of their conservatism. Uh, business models in big pharma targeting magic bullets, which treat the whole of depression, for example. Well, you know, that's a very risky strategy, I think. OK, so some of the possible solutions, uh, Mark Tricklebank and I and some others debated in a recent review article in psychopharmacology. Mark actually used to be the head of Lilly. Uh, research in, in the UK. So he knows quite a lot about Big Pharma. And he, he and we others came up with a, a list of possible approaches which we'd like to put into a, an algorithm to improve translation, if you like. So obviously we have to consider incorporating better clinical uh, criteria in terms of marrying the criteria with neuroscience. And I think the NIMH our doc approach is trying to do that. It has its shortcomings, but this is certainly a very interesting way to go, to try and match up neuroscience with psychiatric diagnosis. This is one of Tom Insull's uh, innovations, in fact. We have to engage the power of neuroscience in translation. Um, for example, if we're using brain imaging, we need to do that in animals as well as in humans to get the same systems and look at how they function under different drug treatments or perturbations, which have relevance for disease. Obviously, we have to identify suitable molecular targets, genomic analysis, stem cells, these are approaches, as well as traditional medicinal chemistry, of course. And, and also, you know, alliances with immunology, because we know that immunology is going to be very important in the future uh, in terms of mental health disorders. And more than ever, we have to collaborate um, academia with industry and also with one another because the problems are so huge. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of that a bit later. Finally, we, we do need to learn and reflect about what's happened in the past and 
maybe repurpose some possibly failed drug targets. I mean, very often big pharma will identify a drug as being useful for this disorder, but they're not realizing that it may be better for another disorder. And I think um, there's plenty, there's such a rich a number of molecules out there that could be candidates for treatment that we need to explore them in more detail. Okay, so this was our kind of algorithm, which um, argues in a, a theoretical way how you could approach this problem of translation. And you can see it embodies reverse translation, um, as, as Tony Phillips has argued. So on the left, we, we start with system neuroscience, which generates transspecies tasks to test animal and human phenotypes, for example, memory across species. Um, then in parallel, we look at the, um, the patient population we're interested in, for example, obsessive compulsive disorder, and really studied in detail to try to find out what the pathophysiology of the, of the disorder might be. And then in parallel, we have disease relevant perturbations, different models may be genetic, pharmacological, developmental, environmental, whatever seems to be relevant from the human perspective. And this is where you need teamwork because ultimately you have to compare a number of models and show convergence that an agent will be successful in treating the, the behavioral impairments that are embodied in many animal models, all of the same condition. If you can get that, then you're probably onto a onto a winner, as it were. Then, of course, we have these uh, strategies for getting the molecules, as I mentioned. They have to be tested in the appropriate tests, checked to see whether the, this target validation, for example, using positron emission tomography, does the drug get into the brain, et cetera, et cetera, what are the appropriate doses? And then ultimately, um, test the drug out in humans in phase two, as well as phase three studies with better measures and for heaven's sake, feed back these results into the process in general, rather than keeping the results secret. Okay, well, let's try and embrace some of these uh, different aspects of the problem. One of the things that's been interesting in me is to define cognition into its various systems and various elements. And the so-called Cantab battery, which we invented a long time ago, tries to do this using touchscreen computer control tests which measures decision-making, planning, uh, cognitive flexibility, these are frontal lobe type uh, deficits, working memory, as well as long-term memory, hippocampal type functions, and simple uh, speed of processing, attention, sensory motor functions, so forth. Okay, well, it's very important to use objective measures of behavior and cognition. Um, and we found, for example, with this test of paired associate memory, which ask people to remember the location of these icons on the screen. Um, this activates the hippocampus. It's been converted into a touchscreen, well, based iPad method, which has been adopted in some GP clinics, and it's been accepted as a mobile device for this type of assessment. And the reason is because it actually is rather good at picking up um, what we call mild cognitive impairment leading to Alzheimer's disease. So you see this, um, this test, these are errors, this is impairment on the y-axis, these are different groups. Alzheimer patients are terrible at this test, um, they, they often fail it even at six items. Um, but um, in an MCI group, a mild cognitive impairment group, some of them are as bad as Alzheimer patients and some of them are quite normal. And it turns out that many of these go on uh, to get ultimately a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, maybe 30 months later. So you're able to detect the disorder early using this method in a rather inexpensive way, which doesn't involve PET scanning and amyloid, of amyloid, for example. Um, and the reason I think you know, this test is, is useful is when you compare it with standard clinical measures like the ADAS-COG, um, paper and pencil battery, you see it doesn't achieve this fantastic resolution. Um, and nor do other tests actually, including um, other traditional tests of memory. So I think there's been insufficient analysis of this type as to which are the best, most precise tests of these functions uh, for uncovering deficits that you can then remediate, possibly with a drug. Now, another important consideration for us has been 
uh, animal to human translation. So a lot of the CANTAB tests are based really on animal tests, uh, which have been proved useful for research for drug discovery. Um, for example, tests of cognitive flexibility, tests of inhibition, tests of sustained attention. And just to show, you know, these tests do come up with the goods for what's seen clinically. So this is a study by my old student, now Professor Bussey, I think he's a UBC graduate, uh, Tony will tell us, um, of the triple transgenic Alzheimer mouse uh, treated with low doses of physostigmine, which is essentially denepazil, uh, which is used clinically. And you can see here that this drug nicely reverses these attentional deficits in a standard CANTAB task, uh, just as predicted from the clinic. So there's a very good tie-in of the animal work with the human work here, despite what people may tell you, if you use the right test. But of course, denepazil isn't a panacea. It doesn't... It, it just treats a symptom, mainly one of atten inattention rather than memory, for example. It doesn't improve memory very much, but it does make patients more aroused and wakeful, which is a benefit, and it, and it, it retards their, um, their deterioration. Okay, so moving on to um, one of the success stories in neuropsychiatry, of course, is the treatment of ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. The remarkable treatment, really, the paradoxical treatment with stimulant drugs, methylphenidate or Ritalin and deamphetamine, which, of course, release uh, dopamine or noradrenaline. They increase dopamine and noradrenaline in the synapse anyway. And these, these drugs have among the biggest effect sizes in the whole of neuropsychiatry. I mean, most of the trials are very positive, at least in terms of improving behavior not quite so convincing for improving academic performance, I hasten to add. However, um, some drugs, of course, um, such as atomoxetine, are preferred as atypical stimulants because they, they don't have the stigma associated with these potential drugs for abuse. And atomoxetine is theoretically very interesting because rather than affecting dopamine predominantly, it mainly affects noradrenaline. And it is rather intriguing that um, dopamine and noradrenaline may be implicated in, in the treatment of ADHD symptoms. In fact, as we pointed out quite repeatedly, despite the fact that these drugs like Ritalin seem to work in ADHD to some extent, um, we still really don't understand the mechanism. And we need to do that. We don't really know what is the basis of the improvement. Is it dopamine? Is, these are rat brains, or is it noradrenaline from the locus cerealis? And, and where are these transmitters working? Are they working in the stratum, which is where most of dopamine is concentrated, or the frontal cortex, or in the case of noradrenaline, presumably in the frontal cortex somewhere? Well, our own research seems to indicate that both actions may be um, useful in the treatment of ADHD at, and po probably several brain locations. So these drugs are like cocktails, essentially, which just by chance seem to target many of the ADHD symptoms. Now, I'm not going to bore you with lots and lots of research results, but I just want to give you a general idea about um, his uh, atomoxidine being treated, uh, being used to treat adult attention deficit disorder and improving performance on a test of inhibition, response inhibition, which prevents impulsive behaviours. And uh, this is the type of program we've followed in Cambridge at the so-called Behavioral and Clinical Neuroscience Institute, which is dedicated to reverse translation of animal to human work, and also dedicated to the idea of repurposing. Uh, can, we, can we do more with atomoxetine, you know, to symptoms of disinhibition in general, for example, which extend across many diagnoses? Now, We've got a good idea where atomoxidine may work in the brain, both from work in rats on the same task and in humans using pharmacological fMRI, you see activating the drug, this region of the prefrontal cortex. So we've got a good idea of the network. And we also know that, rather interestingly, Parkinson patients are bad at inhibition as well, surprisingly, given their motor dysfunction. They are quite bad at in, in, inhibiting their impulses, which is part of their problem. And atomoxidine actually helps here as well, actually, um, improving 
uh, their performance on an inhibition task by improving their ability to make successful stops. And James Rowan Cambridge is pursuing a whole program of repurposing of atomoxidine in Parkinson patients added to their ODOPA to help them improve their executive function and boost uh, frontal stratal connectivity, which is what it does um, when analyzed with resting state um, functional magnetic resonance imaging. So that's just an, an example of how you can take a drug and try and apply it to other conditions. Now we're also going to try and apply it to uh, drug abuse, actually. Um, so these are and this is a list of currently licensed medications for substance use disorders, ranging from the, the opiate um, deficits, as you see, methadone, buprenorphine, uh, alcohol-related disorders, disulfuram, naltrexone, nolmaphene, and acamprosate. Um, many of these are opioid receptor antagonists at the mu receptor. Um, they do tend to reduce drinking, but they overall don't have fantastic effects, for example, on alcohol seeking behaviors. And nicotine, we have renkeline, nicotine gum, buprine. Uh, these are agents which act as substitutes. So there has been some kind of advance here, but this is an intense area of activity and many other agents are currently being tested, including agents working at GABA receptors like gabapentin, um, corticosteroid antagonists like mepiprazone. Um, this is calcium antagonist, I know is of interest in UBC, and also drugs such as atomoxidine and modafinil. And just to show you um, some of our own work looking at um, atomoxidine, we've found that atomoxidine actually intriguingly reduces cocaine-seeking behavior. There aren't any good treatments for cocaine or methamphetamine stimulant disorders. Um, and it also impairs heroin seeking behaviors as well, without, for example, affecting food related behavior. So this isn't a general sedative effect. So this may have some action, for example, in drug abusers who are seeking treatment, who want to help themselves restrain their impulsive drug seeking tendencies. Um, now, there have been trials for drugs like modafinil and um, to some extent, uh, citalopram and others. And I would be critical of these trials because they've generally used um, very severe um, substance use disorder patients who we hypothetically think are in a habit mode and habits are very, very difficult to treat. What you have to do is with so many of these mental health disorders is treat before the damage is gone, is done too much. So treat early. Um, especially if they're treatment seeking. So this would be a suggestion for repurposing. And we've done an experimental medicine study, if you like, with stimulant abusers showing, for example, that atomoxidine does improve stop signal task performance in the lab. Um, and it also, um, as you see here, reduces the interference caused by photos of uh, drug abuse when sub subjects are trying to identify the number of lines on a screen very quickly, for example. So it reduces the distraction caused by cocaine cues, which are so important in um, maintaining uh, drug-related behaviors. Now, another example would be uh, a GSK drug. Um, we call it 498, GSK 498. It's got a much longer number than that. This drug was originally um, developed for obesity and dropped by GSK, but handed to uh, Professor Ed Bulmore in Cambridge to explore as a possible anti-eating binge drug, anti-compulsive eating drug. And, and it does a good job on that actually, certainly in the laboratory. But at the same time, uh, we tested its action on alcohol-related behaviors and compared it with naltrexone, which is of course, um, a licensed medication. Now, these are both mu receptor antagonists, but this 498 is much more uh, sensitive at the mu receptor than naltrexone. And moreover, this drug is a real antagonist. It's not a partial agonist, which is naltrexone like. And indeed, the drug does have bigger effects in many of these uh, procedures. So, for example, um, in a high measurement of alcohol induced high, um, it outperforms naltrexone. It also blunts the response of um, 
in a, an fMRI bold response to alcohol cues in the amygdala and in the midbrain compared to naltrexone in healthy human volunteers. So I think, you know, we need to think much more about um, sophisticated experimental medicine studies, which um, uh, are allied to the animal studies in order to proceed to phase three. And indeed, when we tried this drug in our uh, drug seeking model, as you see here, we saw similarly that the uh, 498 drug did a very good job on initial drug seeking. But once uh, taking had commenced, it had no further effect. So this drug may have some very beneficial effect to prevent drug seeking behaviors. Um, and there's also been uh, applications to alcohol um, drugs, uh, alcohol seeking and alcohol drinking behaviors of the same agent. Moreover, again, outperforming an naltrexone. So getting effects which are longer lasting, lower doses and everything else. But this drug will never be taken any further because GSK have no interest in the treatment of substance use disorders. So it's tragic. It's lost science. OK, well, I'm coming up to the end of the talk now, but um, let me just go back to our algorithm and show you how we try to uh, practically implement this in our research at Lilly, collaborative research between Cambridge, Bristol and Lilly in London. Um, looking for drugs that would, in, would, would enhance cognition uh, in schizophrenia. Okay, so you can see the same general scheme that we use, but this time much more focused on the problems that we see in schizophrenia. For example, in spatial work in memory uh, related to prefrontal function uh, and also hippocampal circuitry and the role of glutamate modulation, which is key in schizophrenia. Um, and then, of course, you can um, model this in disease relevant perturbations. So deletion of chromosome Q22 is one um, quite interesting model. Chronic pharmacological models like fencyclidine treatment or chronic ketamine treatment, ketamine being a psychotogen drug. Neonatal MAM, which impairs the development of the hippocampus and leads to dopamine upregulation or rearing in social isolation. And molecules, of course, were generated by, by Lilly and by other companies um, in this innovative medicines initiative we had in Europe with uh, many drug companies and universities collaborating. Um, MGLUR5, MGLUR23, PAMS, uh, positive allosteric modulators, which are relatively gentle ways of manipulating the glutamate system, 5-HT7 receptor antagonists, and so forth and so on and then testing molecules in relevant perturbations. Well, um, certainly one or two agents came out of this, uh, uh, this program, but uh, failed because of various adverse effects. In one case, um, Lily may have given up on a drug which actually may work in first episode schizophrenia, um, but it stops working when schizophrenia progresses to the chronic stage. And so unfortunately, this only became apparent after a postdoc analysis years after they dropped the drug, uh, which is rather unfortunate. Um, but let me just uh, illustrate this general approach with some of our own work, which I'm going to go very quickly. So we're interested in cognitive flexibility in schizophrenia and other prefrontal function. Uh, we know the networks in the monkey brain, which me mediate this, involving the frontal cortex. Turns out they're very similar in the rat and in the human using brain imaging. So we've got a very good basic neurobehavioral system, which is involved in cognitive flexibility. Uh, then, okay, let's try an agent on cognitive flexibility in humans using the same kind of tests that we use in monkeys. And lo and behold, modafinil, which is an agent we were readily able to use um, after a lot of um, ethical approval, of course, um, added on to antipsychotic medication, actually produced a significant improvement, which is very interesting. It's not going to change the world because no one's going to give modafinil chronically to patients, but it shows, if you like, proof of concept. But the really interesting thing was a study undertaken by Lundbeck using um, a rodent model of cognitive flexibility, which had been impaired by fencyclidine treatment, PCP treatment. This produces grossly cognitively rigid rats and mice. Uh, but when given modafinil, you can see this striking improvement. So this is a case of reverse translation where the 
human study was done first and then shown that it actually worked in the animal model. It's quite remarkable. Now, of course, this is the kind of logic that we need when we're using much more viable agents for treating cognitive deficits in schizophrenia, like, for example, the D1 receptor agonist, if anyone can produce one which is safe and effective and relatively gentle. Um, to be able to demonstrate this kind of um, reverse translation would be vital. Okay, so finally, I want to kind of introduce um, depression as a major uh, focus, other than schizophrenia. Uh, new drugs for depression. Actually, there's been a lot of activity in this area in the last few years, which is quite optimistic, as we pointed out in our review. Um, and this actually, I think this activity reflects the fact that people are slowly realizing that depression is a very heterogeneous syndrome. It requires probably a range of different treatments for different subtypes of depression. Um, now, one example of this is the famous example of ketamine, IV, uh, which is having long lasting effects in treatment resistant depression. And why that's so exciting, of course, is because you need a rapid treatment to prevent suicide, for example. So ketamine is a so-called NMDA receptor antagonist, um, but actually how it works, we still don't really know. I think the current thinking is that it's probably acting at a different class of receptors called the AMPA receptors for glutamate. Um, how is it discovered? That's an interesting story. If you read John Crystal's review in 2019, I would summarize it by saying a kind of serendipity, both instructed based on clinical observation and facts, as it were, and really systematic serendipity. And it's systematic in the sense that uh, in animal models, they tried a whole lot of these NMDA receptor antagonists. And actually, ketamine is the main one that works for reasons which still aren't quite clear. So I just take you back to this uh, quote from the Skolnick paper in 1990, who'd been using animal models of stress uh, to look at these, um, th these types of agent, NMDA receptor antagonists. And, and they quote, they said, substances capable of reducing neurotransmission in the NMDA receptor complex may represent a new class of antidepressants. This is in 1990, you know, a decade before ketamine was actually really used uh, clinically in humans for this reason. Based on these findings, the hypothesis that pathways observed by the NMDA subtype involved in the pathophysiology of affective disorders may have heuristic value. The irony is that these guys never tested ketamine. <laughs> they tested other glutamate receptor antagonists, which have turned out not to be effective in the treatment of depression. But nevertheless, by persistence and by serendipity, ketamine was eventually tried and has these remarkable effects, which I think has boosted activity in certain parts of the big pharma sector. Well, just finally, then, um, I'd like to show... Um, the second wave, if you like, of these new anti antidepressant drugs, um, postpartum depression, very important, retinalone, I think it's just been licensed. Um, Crystal is looking at another treatment specifically for anhedonic symptoms rather than depression as a whole, kappa receptor antagonist. Then depression is often associated with some cognitive problems, particularly in memory. And voltioxetine was developed for that reason. This is a super serotonin reuptake inhibitor with additional efficacy at serotonin receptors and, and, and may work. Additionally, modafinil has been used for that purpose, added on top of a conventional antidepressant, improves memory in elderly patients. And then there's the immunolo immunological um, strategy with interleukin-6 human monoclonal antibodies, which are currently being trialed, and of course, uh, psilocybin and the related psychedelics, which I'm not going to comment on very much, but I think will be an intense uh, portion of our conversation going forwards. So thank you very much. That's all I have to say about um, the challenges in translation. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. I don't see any questions currently, but I know Tony will probably have one to start with. If not, I do. Um, uh, am I live? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Trevor. That was a brilliant summary. 
uh, and um, it certainly lays out both the opportunities and also I was very pleased that you you weren't shy about pointing to the to the shortcomings of uh, much of the work that we do. Um, that raises my question. You've got on your slide right now depression, and throughout the talk, you you made the comment directly and then illustrated it about the need for appropriate animal models. And of course, what I admire so much about your own work is uh, the fact that you do give great um, theoretical uh, consideration to developing the models that you've, that you've described today. Um, and so when we think about depression and animal models of depression, many of the tests, uh, uh, like the one, the crystal one you mentioned, use um, it really extreme forms of stress in order to perturb the animal's behavior and its underlying neurochemistry. But do you really think that those models are appropriate models for something as complex as depression? No, I think, um, you know, and the, the other problem being, that, you know, stress is such a complex phenomenon in itself, isn't it, Tony? Yeah. I mean, there's no, so many absolutely. forms of depression, you know, you have, psychological stress for example versus you know chronic pain induced stress which are probably different animals completely um, and so you know I, I i think one again depression is so difficult because you know th there is some advance on the genetic front but genetic models aren't very helpful to mm -hmm. us so i think you have to go back a little bit to the psychological models um and you know, think about things like um, a lack of control, really. Mm -hmm. You know, lack of control over life events. I mean, the old helplessness model. The problem with that is that it got confounded with this huge stress type model approach. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think uh, you know a subtler version might have paid greater dividends, as it were. Um, so an approach we've been interested in is um, maternal separation. Mm -hmm. You know, mild maternal separation. And Jeff Daly and I and Olivia Stufford have got an article coming out looking at the um, consistency of effects with the traditional tests of depression, like the full swim test, which is, you know, involves stress, um, and the tail suspension technique in mice and these things. And, you know, one of the problems with these tests is that they, they have very poor reproducibility. When you do the meta-analysis, uh, it's all over the place. And, you know, I think on average, it's unsurprising that you get so little, um, you know, re replication of, re of findings. So I think that's, that, that really is an a, you know, important area that we have to look at. I mean, clearly, you've got to simulate in some sense some of the, the pressures that occur on uh, individuals, whether human or other animal. Um, but it mustn't be, you know, so disruptive that it's um, incredibly um, damaging to the brain, as it were. Mm -hmm. And you've got to use more accurate measures for looking at the impact of those of those manipulations. We've found, for example, that um, we've got a test in humans uh, where we look at um, response to negative feedback in a lab situation and find that depressed patients seem to over respond to that and some of the you can use the same kind of test in a in a, in a rodent actually so more or less the same type of test it will be in an operant chamber rather than on a computer touch screen uh, perhaps but um, you can also look at response negative feedback in rodents and you, you you know this is an interesting way forward if you're trying to get what i call functional homology uh, functional systems you know in the human and rodent brain, which are doing the same type of thing, maybe you have a better chance of modeling what goes wrong. Yeah. Thank you, that's uh, very insightful. Lily, back to you for anybody else that would like to. Um, yeah, I see one question here. Um, so it says, thanks Trevor, many of these disorders have an emotional component, obviously. Um, we know comparatively little about your, the neurobiology of emotion. Can you comment on the best way to study emotion in animal models as they relate to psychiatric diseases and in general? This is a question from Dr. Jeremy Siemens at UBC. 
Well, that's very good, yeah. Well, I guess the, the fundamental approach to emotion uh, derives from the kind of theory that people like Jeffrey Gray um, originally developed uh, based on reinforcement learning, you know, so that there is a general idea that you can derive the emotions from application of reinforcement learning theory, for example, rewards and punishment, you know, so, you know, that, that's one approach. So in other words, anxiety can be engendered by a stimulus which signals a noxious event, for example, that, that's a hypothesis. So that's one approach. Another approach is very interesting, is to try and use um, almost machine learning to look at the, the matrix of events that occurs in the body and the brain, which comprise an emotion. You know, so we know our own emotions are particular configurations of autonomic events and, you know, facial expressions, for example. You can do the same kind of thing in animals. Uh, you know, they're even suggesting that mice have facial expressions these days, which signify different emotional states. And I think there might be something in that, you know, the, the biological basis of the emotions. Um, now, the more complex emotions are, are difficult, of course, like empathy, for example. And, the, you know, even there, there are some suggestions now that um, empathic-like responses are being observed in, in rodents, for example, in certain situations. So some of the more complex emotions may be modelled as well, possibly. I think one has to be aware a little bit about anthropomorphism, on the other hand. So you, you have to do this with a very rational approach. Um, but I think those are the two predominant ways I would do it. I'd also, you know, the other way is to take a, a, a neuroscience type approach and say, well, look, we know in humans that the connections between, they say, the anterior cingulate or the subgeneral cingulate and the amygdala and the insula are very important in depression. So let's assume that the same kind of circuitry is implicated in, in experimental animals and, and take it from there. Now, someone I know is doing some really good work in this area uh, in, in monkeys, in marmoset monkeys, is Angela Roberts at Cambridge. And she's turning upside down the role of the prefrontal cortex in emotion, for example, um, by some very clever experiments. Because the marmoset brain is much more similar to the human brain than the rodent brain. So I think there are several approaches here um, which we can use. Mm -hmm. Trevor, if I could just add to that, Tony here. Um, there's some brilliant work being done at Lethbridge by our colleagues in the Pellis lab, where they're looking at ultrasonic vocalization. Not only might a rodent express emotions through facial muscular movement, yeah. Uh, yeah. they're definitely conveying emotions at a frequency we can't hear, you know, yeah. above 25 kilohertz. You know, there's really? a whole when if you go into an animal colony room and if you could hear the, at the frequency that a rat can hear, there'd be a whole host of conversations ongoing. Well, Pellis's lab has formalized this now and in, in some really sophisticated ways. And we've just done a collaboration with them, which is hopefully going to provide a model for us in which we look at a genetic model of depression, which is the Wistar Kyoto rat. Uh, mm -hmm. which we've, Lily and I have written a review on how relevant this model is to depression. But the point here is that when you look at the Wistar control rat and you set up a circumstance where the animal is anticipating the opportunity to play, well, the normal rat uh, in that 10 minute period when it's anticipating being with its friend is chirping away like crazy. And, and they, have a, they have decoded some of the relevance of these sounds, uh, very systematic, objective, reproducible. Um, and, and so, and then when the two animals get together, there's a further conversation. The Wistar Kyoto rat is practically mute. Um, okay. It doesn't interact very well in anticipation of the interaction. Uh, it does engage, um, you know, in a socially relevant way, but it's muted. And so obviously what we're going to be looking at is to see whether or not uh, both uh, standard antidepressants and then new mm. candidates could restore the capacity for normal conversation in these genetically um, mm. mutated rats. So that's another, like bring in yeah. that whole dimension that we ignore as behavioral yeah. science. 
that's a lovely example, Tony. And of course, you know, the ultrasonic vocalization is another aspect of the response profile, the whole thing, you know, mm. uh, which you 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 can embed this in. So I think that's very, very exciting. Right. But but if we take this brief conversation and we put it back into your presentation, you know, you're making a, a great appeal to the behavioral science community to get more sophisticated. I mean, the fact that we endorse tail suspension tests and even even though it's a good uh, predictor of a uh, antidepressant, the four yeah. swim test yeah. to me yeah. just is the poverty and the naivete that you mentioned uh, yeah. at large. You know, why the heck can't we come up with more integrated, more relevant models that do have yeah. greater face validity? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And in the last minute that we have, um, we have one final question from Dr. Michael Krause. Um, if you can comment briefly, Trevor, and the question is, how is the Cambridge psychiatric and psychological research community organizing the relationship between clinical and translational, so preclinical uh, research practically? Uh, I could have um, said more about this uh, five or 10 years ago, actually, <laughs> because, you know, the Behavioral and Clinical Neuroscience Institute we had was funded by the MRC for 10 years. The only, the only fund centers for 10 years. Um, but it didn't receive, it wasn't continued after 2015. So at the moment, um, our translational work has been, I think, hit by this. I mean, it's still going on because one of the great things about the BCNI, as we call it, is it knitted together a lot of investigators uh, in psychiatry and psychology and in neurology and psychology, actually. You know, Ed Bullmore, for example, Karen Ursha works on drug abuse, um, James Rowe in neurology, um, Roger Barker in neurology. So working with people like Jeff Daly and Barry Everett, myself, um, and so on. Um, you know, so, so these people are still there. Um, Angela Roberts still collaborates with um, Ed Bullmore, for example, looking at the development of the Marmoset brain in the context of anxiety. Um, but we don't have that uh, great boost of funding that we had 10 years ago to carry this off. And similarly, the Innovative Medicines Initiative, which is a, an EU thing, you know, that finished around the same time. So it's been a bit disappointing, actually. Um, which is partly why Mark Tricklebank and I wrote that article to just try and point out that, you know, the problems are still ongoing. And I'm so delighted that Matrix N is now taking up the baton. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much, Trevor. Uh, we are out of time, but if you want to hear more from Trevor and Tony, and they'll be joined by Dr. Mike Geyer, um, they'll be ha um, having a workshop during the first block, so in, in nine minutes after a, a short break. Um, so thank you all for joining us, and uh, we'll see you again in 10 minutes. You have eight excellent sessions to choose from. So yeah, see you then. Thank you, Trevor. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Enjoyed, enjoyed talking with you. Brilliant. I'll be back thank after you. my cup of tea. Yes. <laughs> Bye.